Welcome to Level 5 of Verbal Advantage. You've come a long way since Level 1. If you've been reviewing the material diligently all along, by now I imagine you are comfortable with many of the words you've learned, and you probably have also noticed a marked improvement in your verbal awareness. But guess what? There's plenty of useful information, and there are a lot more challenging words to come. So keep listening and reviewing, and you will soon enjoy an even greater verbal advantage. Let's begin Level 5 with a brief overview of the subject of pronunciation. My aim in broaching this topic is twofold, to make you more aware of the importance of good pronunciation and to help you become a more careful, conscientious speaker. Is there a right way and a wrong way to pronounce a word? Do words sometimes have more than one correct pronunciation? If so, are certain pronunciations better or more correct than others? The answer to these questions, in my opinion, is yes. Just as there are good and bad ways to use words, there are right and wrong ways to pronounce them. In some cases, there is even a good, better, and best way, along with bad, worse, and worst. Many linguists and lexicographers would disagree with me. Being descriptive rather than prescriptive in their approach, they do not believe we should make value judgments about meaning, usage, or pronunciation. The truth, however, is that they often do. Many times, a certain pronunciation will not be listed in a dictionary, or it will appear with a cautionary label such as non-standard or substandard. Clearly, that constitutes a value judgment. It says, we don't recognize this pronunciation as legitimate, prevalent, or proper in educated speech. Dictionary editors don't like to admit that they make these sorts of judgment calls, perhaps because they're afraid of being labeled undemocratic or snobbish. But when it comes to pronunciation, I don't think people want to be told that anything goes. They are well aware that in many situations, people will judge them on the way they speak, and quite reasonably, they want to say it right. Therefore, when people consult a dictionary, they expect to find what is considered acceptable and correct, and they appreciate whatever reliable advice they can get. This awareness of the importance of using standard pronunciation is the first step in becoming what is often called a cultivated speaker, someone who cares enough about speaking well to invest some time and energy learning how to pronounce words properly. One meaning of the verb to cultivate is to devote special attention to with the aim of improving, and the adjective cultivated means refined by study and training marked by skill and taste. Cultivated speakers are those who have arrived at their pronunciation not by imitation, but by study and practice. Cultivated speech means the manner in which such conscientious speakers concur on how words should be pronounced, and how that agreement is represented in the dictionaries. The first goal of verbal advantage is to add more words to your vocabulary. The second is to teach you how to use them properly and precisely. And the third is to set you on the path to becoming a cultivated speaker of the language. This last goal is just as important as the others, especially if you do any public speaking or conduct a good deal of your business orally. It's fine to know lots of words and how to use them, but you must also be able to pronounce them properly if you wish to avoid sounding eccentric or even worse, foolish. People will understand you, but they will not consider you a careful speaker if you say height instead of height, wash instead of wash, mischievous instead of mischievous, accurate instead of accurate, drowned instead of drowned, idea instead of idea, irrelevant instead of irrelevant, jewelry instead of jewelry, theater instead of theater, or nuclear instead of nuclear. In all of those examples, my first pronunciation of the word is the one that cultivated speakers consider careless or incorrect. I should also point out that of the three goals of this program, good pronunciation is the easiest to achieve. It may take a while to learn the precise meaning and proper use of a given word, but you can memorize and master its pronunciation in a minute. 
In fact, knowing how to pronounce a word can sometimes help you remember its meaning. But the most challenging task is not learning how to pronounce unfamiliar words. The real work begins with learning to avoid mispronouncing words you already know. The advice I have included throughout Verbal Advantage will help, as will listening carefully to how I pronounce all the words in the program. Not just the keywords, but every word I utter. When you're finished listening, however, you will have to commit yourself to improving your pronunciation on your own. To prepare yourself for that, you need to do three things. One, start paying closer attention to how other people speak. Two, make sure to check the pronunciation of every word you look up in the dictionary. Three, learn how to interpret diacritical marks, the symbols dictionaries use to indicate pronunciation. Here's how you can begin doing all three of these things while you are listening to Verbal Advantage. First, pay close attention to my pronunciation. When I use an unfamiliar word, listen to how I pronounce it and try saying it yourself several times. Then the next time you have a dictionary handy, look up the word and read the pronunciation, the definition, and the etymology. Also, and this is very important, listen to the way I pronounce words you already know. Is my pronunciation the same as yours, or is there a slight difference? If I pronounce a familiar word in an unfamiliar way, make a mental or written note to look that word up and check the pronunciation, preferably in more than one dictionary, so you can compare their opinions. Dictionaries don't differ much in their treatment of definition, but they can vary considerably in how they record pronunciation. By the way, you may have noticed that my accent is different from yours, which brings me to an important point. Accent is a natural part of cultivated speech. In a society as large as ours, people from different parts of the country are bound to say certain words a bit differently. Some people make the mistake of assuming that a different accent constitutes mispronunciation. There is indeed a general American standard for pronunciation, but in most cases it takes into account our regional differences. For example, although I have lived in Southern California for 15 years, I was born and raised in New York City, and I have also lived in New England. Because I spent my formative years in the East, my accent is, for the most part, an Eastern one. While many people in the Midwest and West say orange, berry, charity, prosperity, and majority, I say orange, berry, charity, prosperity, and majority. Depending on where you're from, you may pronounce the adjective meaning happy, spelled M-E-R-R-Y, the verb meaning to wed, spelled M-A-R-R-Y, and the name spelled M-A-R-Y, all in the same way, Mary. Because of my Eastern background, I employ three distinct pronunciations, Mary, Mary, and Mary. The point is, these are differences in accent, not mispronunciations. Both ways of pronouncing these words are acceptable in cultivated speech. If, however, you or I said arrange for orange, prosperity for prosperity, charity for charity, and mari for marry, those would be salient, beastly mispronunciations. You also need to pay close attention to the way words are pronounced by the people around you and by the people on the airwaves. When you listen to the radio or watch television, take note of people's pronunciation, and if something strikes you as different or unusual, jot it down and look it up later. If you hear a friend or co-worker use an unfamiliar pronunciation, take the time to check it in a dictionary as soon as you can. By doing that, not only will you learn the proper pronunciations of the words you add to your vocabulary, you will also ameliorate your pronunciation of the words you already know. To sum up, if you wish to become a better speaker, you must listen critically to the way you and others speak, and you must check your pronunciation in the dictionary, not just the pronunciation of the new words you learn, but also of the words you know and think you are pronouncing correctly. Having made that effort myself, I can tell you it's a sobering moment when you discover you've been mispronouncing a familiar word for years. On the other hand, 
there's a profound satisfaction in knowing that you've uncovered an error and corrected it. Finally, there are two bad habits you must eschew at all costs. By the way, eschew, spelled E-S-C-H-E-W, means to avoid, abstain from. First, don't invent your own pronunciations. When you come across a new word, don't guess how it's pronounced. That's like reading around an unfamiliar word and guessing what it means. Second, don't blindly imitate other people's pronunciation. Monkey hear, monkey say is a risky game. But don't just take my word for it. Take it from the 19th century American lexicographer Noah Webster, whose name appears prominently on the covers of so many of our dictionaries. In his dissertations on the English language, Webster wrote that people tend to model their speech after those whose abilities and character entitle their opinions to respect, but whose pronunciation may be altogether accidental or capricious. Mimicking the pronunciation of people you admire may be the natural thing to do, but more often than not, it will lead you into error. Then you will mislead someone else, and that person will mislead someone else until half the country is saying it wrong and the dictionaries will have to accept it as right. The point is, just because a person is intelligent or accomplished doesn't mean he or she is also a cultivated speaker. Let me share an anecdote with you that illustrates what I mean. Not long ago, a fan of my books on pronunciation called me to relate a disturbing story. She said she was in her last year of medical school, and recently one of her professors had ridiculed her in front of the entire class for her pronunciation of a certain medical term. I had researched the word and written about it in my second book, concluding that her pronunciation was correct and the professor's was wrong. The professor may be an authority on medicine, but that doesn't make him an expert on pronunciation. Moreover, it's horrifying to think that he abused his authority by going out of his way to humiliate someone who, as it turned out, knew more about what she was saying than he did. So the lesson here is, don't take your own or anyone else's pronunciation for granted. When in doubt, go to the dictionary. The last thing you need to do to become a more cultivated speaker is learn how to interpret the diacritical marks or symbols that dictionaries use to show pronunciation. The word diacritical, by the way, means serving to distinguish. Unfortunately, most people are baffled by diacritical marks, and because they are baffled, they simply give up and ignore the whole question of pronunciation altogether, which, as you can imagine, puts them at a distinct verbal disadvantage. The truth is that learning to interpret diacritical marks is much easier than learning to read music or use a word processing program. In fact, if you can balance your checkbook and operate a VCR, then with a minimum of effort, you can familiarize yourself with diacritical marks. Knowing how to decipher these symbols will help you become a better speaker, so let me wind up this discussion by teaching you some of the most common ones. Most people recognize the macron and the breve. The macron, spelled M-A-C-R-O-N, is a horizontal line or dash placed over a vowel that is, over an A, E, I, O, or U. The macron represents the long sound of the vowel, A as in date and fate, E as in even and meter, I as in ice and night, O as in over and total, and U as in music and cute. The breve, spelled B-R-E-V-E, is a small curved mark, like a tiny smile, placed over a vowel to represent the short sound of the vowel. A as in cat and hat, E as in pet and let, I as in hit and sit, O as in hot and not, and U as in up and butter. The diacritical mark people seem to have the most trouble with is the schwa, which is spelled S-C-H-W-A. The schwa looks like a small letter E turned on its head, in other words, printed upside down and backward. The schwa is a versatile symbol used to indicate an unstressed vowel sound that is neither long nor short, 
but lightened, variable, or obscure. For example, to represent the sound of A in ago, E in item, I in sanity, O in comply, and U in focus, dictionary editors use a schwa, a small letter E printed upside down and backward. The last two symbols you should know are the diaresis and the circumflex. Diaresis is spelled D-I-E-R-E-S-I-S. -E -E a diaresis is two dots printed over a vowel. It is also called an umlaut, U-M-L-A-U-T. The diaresis most often is used over an A to indicate an open or broad vowel sound, as in car and father. It may also appear over a U to represent an oo sound, as in flute or roof. Circumflex is spelled C-I-R-C-U-M-F-L-E-X. The circumflex looks like the tip of a tiny arrow, or like an equilateral triangle with the horizontal bottom line removed. More precisely, it's a small carrot, that's C-A-R-E-T, a mark used in copy editing to indicate that something needs to be inserted. The circumflex sits on top of a vowel like a little hood. Depending on the dictionary you use, it may appear over the vowels A, I, O, or U when they are followed by the letter R to indicate that the sound of the vowel blends into the R. For example, AR with a circumflex is pronounced air, as in care. IR with a circumflex is pronounced ear, as in deer and peer. OR with a circumflex is pronounced or, as in store and door. And UR with a circumflex is pronounced er, as in fur, F U R, or fur, F I R. And now for an extremely important piece of advice. Whenever you check a pronunciation in a dictionary, remember to look for the accent mark or marks and note where the primary stress falls. Many mispronunciations occur because people put the accent on the wrong syllable. As my mother was fond of saying when she corrected my pronunciation, don't put your accent on the wrong syllable. Many speakers mistakenly say admirable, formidable, and comparable when the words are properly pronounced admirable, formidable, and comparable. These mispronunciations could be corrected easily by consulting a dictionary. There are dozens more mispronunciations in which the error is simply a matter of misplaced stress. For example, impotent is often mispronounced impotent. Disparate is often mispronounced disparate. Gondola is often mispronounced gondola. Influence is often mispronounced influence. And superfluous is often mispronounced superfluous. You must become keenly aware of where the stress falls in a word, for it seems that almost every day some new error of this type crops up and gains currency. In recent years, I have heard numerous broadcasters say mayoral and electoral. To the best of my knowledge, only one dictionary recognizes these variants, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate 10th edition, which is exceptionally permissive regarding pronunciation. The traditional and proper pronunciations are mayoral and electoral. If you make sure to note which syllable receives the primary stress every time you look up a word, you won't be misled by these or any other eccentric or erroneous pronunciations you may hear. Finally, spend some time studying your dictionary's pronunciation key. Though most dictionaries use the symbols I have just discussed, there are always variations, and each key is individual. Read the section on pronunciation in the guide to your dictionary, which is part of the front matter, the material preceding the vocabulary. When you think you have a basic understanding of the key, turn to any page in the dictionary, find a word you don't know, and try to pronounce it. Do the symbols make sense right away, or do you have to refer to the key for help? Most dictionaries print a condensed key at the bottom of every other page. This is a very helpful feature. 
Refer to this condensed key until you become comfortable with the common diacritical marks, and if you come across a symbol you don't understand, look it up in your dictionary's guide. Now that you know what to do to become a more conscientious speaker of the language, it's time to give you some more words you can use to embellish your cultivated speech. So without further ado, here are the f word one. Voluble. V-O-L-U-B-L-E. Talkative, talking much and easily, characterized by a great and continuous flow of words. Synonyms of voluble include long-winded, glib, word eight of level three, garrulous, word eight of level four, loquacious, verbose, word 30 of level two, and effusive. Antonyms include reticent, terse, word three of level three, laconic, word 18 of level three, and taciturn. Voluble refers to a person who talks freely and easily, and usually at great length. It may also mean characterized by a great and continuous flow of words. In this sense, either speech or writing may be voluble. Word two, commiserate, C-O-M-M, I-S-E-R-A-T-E. -E. To sympathize, feel or express sympathy, show sorrow or pity for. A somewhat unusual synonym of commiserate is the verb to condole, C-O-N-D-O-L-E, which means to grieve in sympathy, express condolence. To commiserate comes from a Latin verb meaning to pity, and by derivation, commiserate means to share someone else's misery. Commiserate is often followed by with. When Sally lost her job, her co-workers commiserated with her. Word three. Dilemma. D-I-L-E-M-M-A. A predicament. In general, any difficult problem or unpleasant situation. Specifically, a predicament in which one must choose between equally undesirable alternatives. As I mentioned in my discussion of quandary, keyword 27 in level 3, the word dilemma is often used today of any difficult problem or troublesome situation, but many good writers and speakers object to that as loose usage. Dilemma comes from the Greek di, meaning to, and lemma, a proposition and by derivation means a choice between two propositions. Strictly speaking, dilemma should be used only of situations in which one faces a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. Elected officials often face the dilemma of either voting for what their constituents want and going against their conscience, or voting their conscience and losing the support of their constituents. The words quandary, quagmire, and dilemma all refer to complicated and perplexing situations from which it is difficult to disentangle oneself. Quandary emphasizes confusion and uncertainty. Someone in a quandary has no idea what to do to get out of it. Quagmire, spelled Q-U-A-G-M-I-R-E, emphasizes hopelessness and impossibility. Literally, a quagmire is a bog, a tract of soft, wet ground. When used in a figurative sense, quagmire refers to an inextricable difficulty. Someone in a quagmire feels hopelessly stuck and unable to get out. By derivation, a dilemma is a choice between two equally undesirable, unfavorable, or disagreeable propositions. Hamlet's famous dilemma was to be or not to be. Colloquial or informal expressions for the state of being in a dilemma include in a fix, in a pickle, between a rock and a hard place, and between the devil and the deep blue sea. Word four, transitory, T-R-A-N-S-I-T-O-R-Y. Passing, temporary, fleeting, not permanent or enduring. 
The words transitory, transient, ephemeral, and evanescent all mean passing, temporary. Evanescent comes from the Latin verb evanescere, to vanish, disappear, and refers to something that appears briefly and then fades quickly away. Evanescent memories, evanescent joy. Ephemeral, word 12 of level 4, means literally lasting only a day, but in a broad sense, it refers to anything conspicuously short-lived. Our precious youth is ephemeral, lasting, it would seem, but a day. Transient, word 31 of level 2, refers to anything that lasts or stays only for a short while. A transient occupant, a transient event. Transient and our keyword transitory both come from the Latin transire, to go or pass over, the source also of the familiar words transit and transition. Transitory refers to something that by nature must pass or come to an end. Life is transitory, and sometimes so is love. Word 5. Philanthropic. P-H-I-L a-N-T-H-R-O-P-I-C Charitable, benevolent, humane, motivated by or done out of a desire to help or improve the welfare of others. The corresponding noun philanthropy means a desire to help others, especially through charitable giving. Philanthropy and philanthropic both come from the Greek Philain, to love, and anthropos, man. Philanthropy means literally love of mankind. The adjective philanthropic means literally loving mankind. You can see the Greek philain, to love, in such words as philosophy, literally love of wisdom, and philharmonic, literally loving or devoted to music. You can see the Greek anthropos, man, in anthropology, the study of mankind, of human customs, habits, and traditions, and anthropomorphic, shaped like or resembling a man or human being. The words philanthropic, humanitarian, altruistic, and charitable all mean helping others. Charitable refers specifically to giving money to help others. Altruistic suggests unselfish giving. Humanitarian applies to persons or organizations devoted to reducing the pain and suffering of others. Philanthropic literally means motivated by a desire to help others. Today, the word is used chiefly of persons or organizations that make large charitable gifts, fund endowments, or finance humanitarian or cultural institutions. Word 6. Lethargy. L-E-T-H-A-R-G-Y. Lack of energy, sluggishness, dullness, apathy, stupor, an abnormally dull, drowsy, inactive condition or state of mind. The corresponding adjective is lethargic, which means sluggish, drowsy, dull, Apathetic. Dan always felt lethargic after a big business lunch. Whenever we visit the zoo, the bears and the lions seem lethargic. Weeks after getting over the flu, Emily still felt lethargic. According to the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, lethargy may be caused by factors such as illness, fatigue, or overwork, but it manifests itself in drowsy dullness or apathy. The words apathy and lethargy are close in meaning. Apathy, spelled A-P-A-T-H-Y, suggests an indifferent state of mind, a thorough lack of emotion or concern. Analysts predict that voter apathy will result in a low turnout for the election. Lethargy is a prolonged state of dullness, inactivity, or lack of energy, a sluggish condition either of body or mind. The Renaissance roused Europe from the intellectual lethargy 
of the Middle Ages. As every college professor knows, nothing can penetrate or cure the lethargy of the college student who has partied too hard the night before. More difficult synonyms of lethargy include torpor, somnolence, lassitude, languor, L-A-N-G-U-O-R, and stupefaction. Word 7. Exonerate. E-X-O-N-E-R-A-T-E. To free from blame, free from a charge or the imputation of guilt. Declare blameless or innocent. Synonyms of exonerate include acquit, absolve, and exculpate, also pronounced exculpate. Exculpate comes from the Latin ex, meaning out, and culpa, blame, and means literally to free from blame. Do you remember the word onerous, word 13 in level 4? Onerous means burdensome, and the corresponding noun and onus means a burden. Exonerate combines the Latin ex, out, with onus, a burden to mean removing a burden. In modern usage, removing the burden of guilt. Word 8. Pugnacious. P-U-G-N-A-C-I-O-U-S. Given to fighting. Combative. Quarrelsome ready and willing to fight. Challenging synonyms of pugnacious include contentious, belligerent, and bellicose. Antonyms include peaceable, clement, word 43 of level 2, and amicable. Pugnacious comes from the Latin pugnare, to box, fight with the fists, and still has the connotation of someone ready to put up his dukes. From the same Latin pugnare, to fight, we inherit the word pugilist, a boxer, someone who fights with his fists. Word 9. Contrition. C-O-N-T-R-I-T-I-O-N. Remorse. Penitence. Repentance deep and devastating sorrow for one's sins or for something one has done wrong. Penitence is sorrow for having sinned or done wrong. It is often temporary. The penitent person may say, I'm sorry today and sin again tomorrow. Remorse is deep sorrow. The remorseful person is tortured by a sense of guilt and wishes he could erase what he has done. Contrition is even more intense than remorse. It comes from a Latin verb meaning to crush, and by derivation means a crushing sense of guilt accompanied by a sincere, earnest desire to repent, make amends, and change for the better. Contrition is the noun. The corresponding adjective is contrite, remorseful, penitent, full of guilt, regret, and sorrow for one's sins or offenses. When Larry's wife found out about his mistress and his sleazy real estate deals and threatened to leave him, Larry was contrite and swore he'd mend his ways. Word 10. Abrogate. A-B-R-O-G-A-T-E. To abolish by legal or authoritative action or decree. Synonyms of abrogate include cancel, revoke, repeal, annul, nullify, and rescind, word 31 of level 3. To abolish means to do away with, to abolish slavery, abolish cruel and unusual punishment. Rescind, revoke, and repeal all suggest a formal withdrawal. Rescind means literally to cut off. You rescind an order. Revoke means literally to call back. You revoke a contract. To repeal means literally to call back on appeal and applies to something canceled 
that formerly was approved. We repeal a law or an amendment. To annul and to abrogate mean to cancel or make void. A marriage may be annulled. Rights and privileges are abrogated, abolished by authoritative action or decree. Free. 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 Let's review the ten key words you've just learned. Listen carefully to the following questions. After each one, decide whether the correct answer is yes or no. Would a voluble person also be reticent? No, reticent means reluctant to speak. Voluble means talkative, characterized by a great and continuous flow of words. Can you commiserate with someone who is unhappy? Yes, to commiserate is to sympathize, show sorrow or pity for. If you are faced with choosing between the lesser of two evils, are you in a dilemma? Yes, a dilemma is a predicament. Specifically, a predicament in which one must choose between equally undesirable alternatives. Could the blooming of springtime flowers be described as transitory? Yes, transitory means passing, temporary, fleeting, not permanent or enduring. Is making money the goal of a philanthropic institution? No, philanthropic means charitable, benevolent, humane, motivated by or done out of a desire to help or improve the welfare of others. Does lethargy mean a state of excitement or agitation? No, lethargy means lack of energy, sluggishness, an abnormally dull, drowsy, inactive condition or state of mind. When a jury pronounces someone guilty, is the person exonerated? No, to exonerate means to free from blame, declare blameless or innocent. Is a pugnacious person likely to pick a fight with you? Yes, pugnacious means combative, quarrelsome, ready and willing to fight. Is contrition a state of quiet contemplation? No, contrition is remorse penitence, repentance, deep and devastating sorrow for something one has done wrong. Can your house and property be abrogated? No, or at least let's hope not. To abrogate means to abolish by legal or authoritative action or decree. That concludes the review for this section. Now let's learn the next 10 keywords in level 5. Word 11. Officious. O F F I C I O U S. Meddlesome. Nosy. Intrusive. Interfering. Prying. Specifically, offering unwanted advice or unnecessary services, especially in a high handed, overbearing way. The officious person butts in and tries to tell others what to do, or offers help that others do not need. The officious person is a meddler, a busybody. Lucy was sick and tired of her officious supervisor, who would constantly peer over her shoulder and in a single breath tell her what to do, offer to help her do it, and then upbraid her for not doing it right away. A more difficult and unusual word for this type of unpleasant person is quidnunc, Q-U-I-D-N-U-N-C. Quidnunc comes directly from Latin and means literally 
what now? The quidnunc always wants to know what's going on. The busybody is always sticking his or her nose into your business. And the officious person is always trying to manage your affairs. Word 12. Intractable. I-N-T-R-A-C-T-A-B-L-E. Hard to manage or control. Stubborn. Unruly. Antonyms of intractable include obedient, compliant, malleable, word 29 of level 2, docile, and tractable. The antonyms tractable and intractable come from the Latin tractare, to drag around, haul, and also to manage, control. The familiar words traction and tractor come from the same source. Both tractable and intractable are used chiefly of persons rather than things. Tractable means obedient, compliant, easily managed. Intractable means stubborn, unruly, hard to manage or control. Prol. Prol. Word 13. Altruism. A-L-T-R-U-I-S-M. Selflessness. Unselfish concern for the welfare of others. In the philosophy of ethics, altruism refers to the doctrine that promoting the welfare of society is the proper and moral goal of the individual. In this sense, altruism is opposed to egoism, self-centeredness, specifically the doctrine that self-interest is the proper goal of the individual, that the only sensible thing to do in life is look out for number one. Egoism, E-G-O-I-S-M, is distinguished from egotism, E-G-O-T-I-S-M, both in spelling and meaning. Egotism is extreme self-involvement, excessive reference to oneself in speech or writing. The egotist cannot stop talking about himself. Egoism implies self-centeredness, concern for oneself. The egoist cares only about his own needs, concerns, and goals. Egoism is unpleasant, but less intense and disagreeable than egotism. On the opposite end of the spectrum is altruism. The altruist is selfless, highly moral, and puts the needs of others and of society first. Altruism is unselfish concern for others. Word 14. Accolade. A-C-C-O-L-A-D-E. An award. Sign of respect or esteem. Expression of praise. Mark of acknowledgement. Anything done or given as a token of appreciation or approval. At the ceremony, she received an accolade from the president for her work. He was showered with accolades after the success of his project. Here's an interesting word story for you. Accolade comes through French and Italian from the Latin accolare, to embrace, which comes in turn from ad, meaning to, and column, the neck, the source of the word collar. Originally, an accolade was an embrace, specifically the ritual embrace used in conferring knighthood. At one time, this consisted of a ceremonial kiss and a light blow on each shoulder with the flat side of a sword. Later, the embrace was dropped and the ceremony was limited to the tap on each side of the collar with a sword. From this ritual, the word accolade has come to mean any special recognition of merit achievement, or distinction. My preferred pronunciation for this word is accolade, but there are no fewer than three other acceptable pronunciations. Accolade, with the stress on the first syllable, accolade, and accolade. Word 15. Vernacular. 
V E R N A C U L A R. The native language of a people, especially the common everyday language of ordinary people, as opposed to the literary or cultured language. The noun vernacular may refer to a native language as opposed to a foreign one, and the adjective vernacular may mean native as opposed to foreign. As English is my vernacular tongue. More often, though, vernacular is used to mean the common everyday language of ordinary people. A vernacular expression is a popular expression, one used by ordinary folk. Vernacular literature is either popular literature or literature written in everyday as opposed to formal language. The phrase "in the vernacular." Means in ordinary and unpretentious language. I'm not going to do it is formal language. I ain't going to do it is in the vernacular. He doesn't wish to speak with anyone is formal language. He don't want to talk to nobody is vernacular. These examples of vernacular English are considered ungrammatical and substandard. And I want to be careful not to give you the impression that bad English is the only form of vernacular English. The vernacular comprises all language that is common and informal, any word or expression that ordinary people use, whether it is considered bad or good, acceptable or improper. In modern English usage, H. W. Fowler describes the vernacular as the words that have been familiar to us for as long as we can remember. The homely part of the language, in contrast with the terms that we have consciously acquired. Calling someone a sharp cookie is the vernacular way of calling someone intelligent, perceptive, judicious, or sagacious. Saying someone is a phony is the vernacular way of saying someone is a sham, an impostor, or a charlatan. The vernacular of the East differs from the vernacular of the West. And often, residents of different parts of the same state or city have their own vernacular, common, informal, everyday language. Word sixteen, judicious. J U D I C I O U S. Wise and careful, having or showing sound judgment. Synonyms of judicious include sensible, level-headed, prudent (word forty-seven of level one), and discreet. Antonyms include thoughtless, foolhardy, impetuous, and temerarious. Judicious comes through the Latin judicium (judgment) from judex, a judge. Udex and the Latin verb udicare to judge, pass judgment, are also the source of the English words judge, judgment, judicial, pertaining to a judge or to a judgment, and judiciary, judges collectively or the judicial branch of government. As long as we are passing judgment on all these words, here's a spelling tip. Everyone knows the word judge has an e at the end. But many people don't seem to realize that there is no e in the middle of the word judgment. The British prefer to retain this medial e and spell the word j u d g e m e n t. The preferred American spelling, however, is j u d g m e n t. Our keyword judicious means having or showing sound judgment. A judicious decision is a wise and careful decision. A judicious course of action is a sensible, level-headed, prudent course of action. Action. Act. Word seventeen. Chrysalis. C H R Y S A L I S. The pupa of a butterfly. The stage in the development of the insect between the larval and adult stages. During which the insect is enclosed in a case or cocoon. Chrysalis is now also used in a figurative sense, 
to mean a sheltered and undeveloped state or stage of being. Promising young artists and writers have always had to break out of their creative chrysalis to achieve the recognition they deserve. After four years at college, she emerged from her chrysalis in the ivory tower into the great wide-open world, fully mature and ready to accomplish great things. In this general sense, chrysalis is a useful word that can add a nice touch of style to your expression. Be careful, however, to use it precisely. The danger lies in confusing chrysalis with the words transformation and metamorphosis. Listen to this sentence, which was written by a theater critic about a performance of George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. Dirickson is convincing and eminently likable as Eliza, deftly handling the chrysalis from street urchin to lady, while along the way growing in confidence and independence. You cannot handle a sheltered and undeveloped state from one thing to another. What the critic meant to describe was a change that resembled the transformation a butterfly undergoes from its larval stage, when it is but a caterpillar, through its chrysalis, its stage of development in the shelter of the cocoon, and then to fully formed adulthood. The proper word for that transformation is metamorphosis. Chrysalis means a sheltered state or undeveloped stage of being. Word 18. Genteel. G-E-N-T-E-E-L. Refined, polite, well-bred, sophisticated, elegantly stylish or fashionable, pertaining or belonging to high society. Genteel came into English in the early 17th century from the French gentil, which at the time meant noble, polite, graceful. Originally, genteel meant possessing the qualities of those of high birth and good breeding. That definition is still listed in current dictionaries, but today genteel usually suggests an excessive or affected refinement, and the word is often applied to someone or something that is trying to appear socially or intellectually superior. Word 19. Jovial. J-O-V-I-A-L Merry, full of good humor, hearty and fun-loving, jolly, convivial. The exclamation, by Jove, means literally, by Jupiter, the name of the chief deity in Roman mythology, called Zeus by the ancient Greeks. From Jove, who was renowned for his love of feasting and merriment, we inherit the word jovial, literally like Jove, merry, good-humored, convivial. Word 20. Subterfuge. S-U-B-T-E-R-F-U-G-E. A deception, trick, underhanded scheme. Synonyms of subterfuge include stratagem, artifice, and ruse, R-U-S-E. By derivation, subterfuge means to flee secretly, escape. In modern usage, the word applies to any secret or illicit plan or activity designed to conceal a motive, escape blame, or avoid something unpleasant. Mystery and spy novels abound with myriad examples of the art of subterfuge. Be careful not to soften the G in this word and say subterfuge. The fuge should rhyme with huge. Subterfuge. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. 
Listen carefully to the following statements and decide whether each one is true or false. An officious person is industrious and reliable. False. Officious means meddlesome, nosy, intrusive, specifically offering unwanted advice or unnecessary services, especially in a high-handed, overbearing way. It's hard to get an intractable person to do what you want. True, intractable means hard to manage or control, stubborn, unruly. If more people were motivated by altruism, the world would be a better place. Definitely true. Altruism is selflessness, unselfish concern for the welfare of others. Winning an outstanding service award or being selected as employee of the month would be an accolade. True. An accolade is an award, sign of respect or esteem, anything done or given as a token of appreciation or approval. Expressed in the vernacular means expressed in polite, formal language. False. The vernacular is the common, everyday language of ordinary people, as opposed to the literary or cultured language. Driving under the influence of alcohol is a judicious act. False. Judicious means wise and careful, having or showing sound judgment. When something emerges from a chrysalis, it is transformed. True. A chrysalis is the pupa of a butterfly, the stage during which the insect is enclosed in a cocoon. Figuratively, a chrysalis is a sheltered and undeveloped state or stage of being. Genteel conversation is lively and good-natured. False. Genteel means refined, polite, sophisticated, elegantly stylish or fashionable belonging to high society. A jovial person is haughty and domineering. False. Jovial means merry, full of good humor, hearty and fun-loving, jolly, convivial. If you discover that a co-worker has been doing nasty, sneaky things behind your back to make you look bad, then you are a victim of subterfuge. Sad but true. Subterfuge means a deception, trick, underhanded scheme. That concludes the review for this section. Did you remember to keep track of your answers and calculate your score?